generally speaking, you're not looking to sell properties right now. It's not like you're flipping, you're buying and flipping and buying and flipping. You're actually retaining a portfolio. Yeah, that that is the strategy, really. Our goal is to buy properties and hold on to them. And we're in a market, so I'm on the West Coast, which is a highly appreciating market for a lot of reasons. And then where I am specifically is the most affordable major West Coast city. So I feel like that plays really well with what we're trying to do. And we're still seeing this this upswing. So we've got the, uh, the appreciation of the homes in our favor. Rents have also historically gone up. The idea of if I can find a property that my worst case scenario is that I'm breaking even as a long-term rental, I feel like that's a win. Like that is a total win. And then the sort of hack that we've added on top of that is doing the short-term rental to accelerate income and pay off on the properties. Hi, Envisioners. Welcome to the Envisioner podcast. This is the podcast where we envision living our best lives by exploring everyday topics related to health, wealth, community, and love. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be considered to be medical, legal, tax, financial, or other professional advice. This podcast does not encourage or endorse any illegal activity. We are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liability that may arise from the information in this podcast. The views explored in the podcast may not always be those of the host. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about the incredible journey of building a $2.5 million real estate portfolio in just five years. Our guest today is a remarkable real estate investor from Oregon, an advocate for those suffering from homelessness, and the brilliant mind behind the real estate podcast, A Few Good Doors. I'm so excited to welcome Anne Reed to the Envisioner podcast. In this episode, we'll be diving into Anne's journey into the real estate investing game, exploring the strategies she has used to amass such an impressive portfolio, discuss some of the challenges she has no doubt faced and how she's overcome these and provide valuable resources for those interested in starting their own real estate investment journey. So without further ado, let's get started. Thank you so much, Anne, for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and um, just share as much as I can. Amazing. Well, we're super excited to have you. So thank you. I'd love to start by talking about how you actually got into real estate investing. Um, uh, so that story starts and I tell this to, to people that I'm helping buy homes. I feel like that journey started when we bought our first house. Um, we didn't know that that was the start of our real estate investment journey, but it was, um, so the gist of it is, is that we, we bought a house, we lived in it for a few years started having children, outgrew the house, and then um, needed to, wanted to get into a house that would fit our family better. And then we, I knew there was a way, I wasn't a realtor at the time, I knew there was a way that we could hold on to that house and take the equity out of it and purchase another house, but I didn't have anybody who could teach me how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up selling that house and um, we bought the house, lived in it. We were, our family was growing. I knew there was a way to take equity out of the house and buy a new house. I didn't know exactly how to do that. I talked to um, several realtors and lenders. I wasn't a realtor at the time and nobody could tell me how to do it. So we ended up selling that house and um, buying our move up house that was a better size for our family. Fast forward about 10 years, a little bit more than that, I did get my real estate license and shortly after that learned how to do exactly what I was trying to do with that starter 
home and found that it was so much simpler um, than I had imagined. I didn't really understand why nobody could teach me how to do it. So once I learned how to do it, I started doing it. And as a realtor vowed that I would teach anybody else who wanted to listen how they could do it too. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So, okay, let's get back to it. So it was 10, it was 10 years ago when you were looking to sell your family home, right? Yeah. Right? So yeah. that was, that was actually more than 10 years ago. So that okay. was back in 2006. Okay. That we were going, to, that we wanted to, I'm old. No. <laughs> um, um, that we wanted to hold on to our starter home and sell yeah. um, or, and buy a, a, another home, but we ended up selling that home, buying another home. And then that was our family home for another decade um, until I got my real estate license. And then we learned how to pull equity out of that house. And that's why I say like, we really started building that real estate por portfolio. What we ended up doing is rather than buying another home with the equity from that house, and this was more for personal reasons than as a strategic investment move, we pulled the equity out of the house and built a tiny home on our property, a guest house on our property. The reason for that was um, at the time, my parents were unsure whether or not they would end up living with us at some point, and they had kind of gone back and forth. Um, and we finally were just like, you know what, we're just going to take the equity out, build this tiny house um, on the, the property. And in the meantime, we can start, like, if they decide to use it, they'll it'll be there, it'll be ready for them. In the meantime, we can rent it out on Airbnb and have it start paying for itself. So that was kind of uh, really the start of our investing in real estate, um, because though we wanted to before, we were unable to. Okay. And so the Airbnb, okay, let's, so I, what I wanted to ask you was going back to like, when you're thinking about selling the house, but you're, well, you're at that crossroads, you're like, do we sell? Do we you know, retain and refinance. How did you even know about this idea or possibility of refinancing? Because I think we're always taught at a very young age um, that it's so risky to have a mortgage and we need to pay off. The traditional way of thinking is pay off the mortgage ASAP and don't be in debt in terms of, you know, your mortgage. And so how did you did you just intuitively know or had you been kind of listening to some something like some sort of program educational program that you were like oh this idea of refinancing because that's only something that i learned about probably in the last two or three years so i'm just curious how, how you knew about that i think it was a little bit of both i mean kind of dating back we didn't really have podcasts or i mean i think back then maybe blogs were i mean like that was all really new. So we didn't have yeah. this huge resource of information at our fingertips like we do now. So I think a lot of it was intuitive and maybe just having seen somebody somewhere along the line do that. Um, it certainly was not in my family. I did not come from a, you know, a real estate family. Um, my parents were entrepreneurs, but they were not they were more struggling entrepreneurs than, um, you know, real estate investors. So mm -hmm. I think it's intuitive and actually what we did, and this is like a slight different, but it can make it, uh, it's different enough to mention. So we didn't actually refinance. What we did is got a home equity line of credit. So that's a, just a different tool to use to pull equity out of your home. The reason that we did the home equity line of credit is one, it's a way less expensive product to use. Um, when you do a cash out refinance, you end up paying a lot more to the lender. Um, oftentimes with a home equity line of credit, I think we paid like in fees, like $75. Um, and that was just for the appraisal which was a drive-by appraisal versus like a full appraisal um but the real reason that we did it is when you do a home equity line of credit 
you one don't start paying on it until you actually start using it so you can have a line of credit similar to like a credit card but it's got a much lower interest rate than a credit card so you have this line of credit sitting there and you don't pay on it until you actually pull the money and use it so that's a benefit if you're not exactly sure you know when you're going to use it the other big benefit in the strategy that we we're using is that you pay interest only payments on that versus paying principal and interest for up to 10 years. Okay. So when you're try, I mean, just like any business that you're starting, it's usually not profitable, you know, year one, day one. So the idea of being able to pay interest only was appealing to us because it was a lower payment than paying principal and interest. And we thought that would be beneficial as we were sort of ramping up this business that we had no idea how it would do, you know, how, like how much money we would bring, be bringing in. We kind of could guess, but we hadn't, we didn't have any experience and we didn't know anybody that was doing it either. So yeah. we were sort of figuring it out as we went. Right. Okay. And then, okay, that's so, so then all of a sudden you have this, which is so great. So you have a line of credit and you decide you're going to take out the actual, like re remove or take out the actual line of credit. Mm -hmm. um, you don't take out the full amount. Presumably you only take out a, a partial amount to cover the building of that sort of guest house yes. in the Airbnb. And then were you immediately starting to rent it out or were you, you know, with the proviso that like in however many years perhaps parents might come and live on on the property yeah so we actually took it out in increments um you know when you're building something you usually have like a sizable down payment and then when the builder meets certain benchmarks you pay again um so that was good so we didn't have to take the full amount out up front um but yeah pretty qu quickly after we got our um, certificate of occupancy for that building. Um, I think it was around a month because you also then have to come in and furnish it and you know get it, get photos and stuff for Airbnb. Um, there's also locally, there's permitting process for getting your Airbnb, um, basically like a short-term rental license. And um, so it was about a month between when we got that final build permit and started renting it out. Wow. And so did, were you kind of nervous about kind of doing this business or was it exciting? And were you kind of just jumping in two feet? Um, a little bit of both. So this kind of ties into the strategy that I use for investing. Um, I, we were like, okay, we know people are renting homes like this out on Airbnb. Um, I had done research and had figured out that you can usually over, I mean, Airbnb income is, you know, variable. It's not as steady. Like if you had a long-term renter in, Okay. Yeah. if you took sort of the yearly income from a short-term rental versus a long-term rental, it's usually about double of what a long-term rental would be wow. so it while it was a little bit scary I was always like our worst case scenario is that we rent it as a long-term rental and knowing that that dollar amount was a little bit easier to figure out and knowing that that would cover that interest only payment on the home equity line of credit made it a little less scary Hmm. Okay. Gotcha. And if yeah, someone so it seemed like a good risk to take, to try <laughs> to make twice as much money, knowing we could always go back. Yeah. A hundred percent. Can we just run through if there's someone listening, um, who is not really familiar with the difference between interest only versus interest and principal mortgages. Can you just kind of give a highlight of what the difference is and the benefits with both? So um, the interest only payment is literally when I, it's a little hard to explain, I'm not a lender. So when you get a mortgage of any type and a home equity line of credit is essentially a second mortgage on your home. Um, so when you have 
the interest only, you're literally paying just interest. Principal is what brings down the balance of the loan. So interest only, you're not paying down any of the, the principal of the loan or the balance of the loan. You're just paying for the basically the use of the money. Um, if you, when you get a mortgage, um, I would say at best, and sometimes it's even worse than this, but when you get a mortgage, typically when you start out, you're paying a lot more in interest than you are principal. So you're barely chipping away at principal on even a regular mortgage. So with a cash out refi, um, you, you know, you're lucky if it's like a 50% is going towards principal. Um, so essentially like you would be doubling your payment at best doing the cash out refi and paying principal and interest versus just paying the interest only. Mm, okay. Um, well, let, we'll get into that, I guess, when we talk about, you know, just practical advice uh, for people starting out, but okay. So then, so let's get back to your journey then. So, um, you build this Airbnb business, um, but then this is still on the property of your family home, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this isn't necessarily as part of the amassed $2.5 million that you, your portfolio right now, this is just like almost the precursor to that. Is that right? Uh, well, actually it is part of it because what we then did is when, so we took the equity out of the home. And then we built this other home, which essentially adds more, you know, more value right. Right. to the home. Yeah. So our next move was to then go back to the bank and say, okay, now our home is worth this much more. We'd like to rewrite our home equity line of credit so that we can pull more equity out. Okay. So we basically kind of recycled yes. that. Um, so then we about two years later, pulled equity out and bought a new primary residence. And we've just rinsed and repeated that process minus we didn't build the, it's called an ADU. We didn't build the guest house on the second or third okay. um, property. Right. So. so rinse and repeat. Now, again, this is sort of maybe the mindset that I have. This is like, oh my gosh, you're going into more and more debt. Isn't this really scary? What would that you is say? A very valid um, thought. And I think especially people like my age and older, um, probably a lot of people have heard of Dave Ramsey and he was a very big advocate for, you know, paying down your mortgage. Um, you know, his whole thing is like, basically debt, debt is bad. Um, so you want to get rid of it. My, my take on that is that there's good debt and bad debt. So in what we're doing, we're basically leveraging debt to control larger value assets that then in our market double in value every 10 to 12 years. So in my opinion, it would be foolish not to take that opportunity. If I would, I mean, I would still be paying down that first mortgage of the house and I would not have been able to accumulate $2.5 million in assets that in 10 to 12 years will be 5 million. And in another 10 to 12, you know, like there's no guarantee that that will happen. But if you look back historically, dating back to in, where I live, um, dating back to the 1960s, that has been the case is that homes double in value in that, that period of time, typically, even in the worst decades of recessions and stuff like that, we have decade for decade, these increases. Interesting. That is great. And I love hearing like that is such an interesting, I like this kind of statistics and looking back and looking at the data. Um, and I, I love this idea of like doubling, you know, or at least, yeah, in that range, the idea of the prospect of doubling every 10 to 12 years. And I think we, we spoke about this separately before, but this idea of almost like generational wealth that you start creating and the sort of legacy that you leave 
in terms of your children and so on this idea that because presumably and again i i still want to get into like the nuts and bolts of, of how over five years you amassed it but like generally speaking you're not looking to sell properties right now it's not like you're flipping you're buying and flipping and buying and flipping you're actually retaining a portfolio so can you talk yeah. a little bit about that as well yeah, that that is the strategy, really. Um, and again, so there's a couple of components. So this kind of gets into the practical part of it as well. Is yes, we're our goal is to buy properties and hold on to them. And we're in a market. So I'm on the West Coast, which is um, a highly appreciating market for a lot of reasons and then where i am specifically is the most affordable major west coast city so i feel like that plays really well with what we're trying to do like we can our debt or not debt to income but our income like median income compared to median house price is very favorable in portland so we have the benefit of getting houses relatively more affordably than say Seattle or San Francisco or LA. Um, and we're still seeing this, this upswing. So we've got the, uh, the appreciation of the homes in our favor. Um, rents have also historically gone up. Um, so then the, the, the idea of if I can find a property that my worst case scenario is that I'm at breaking even as a long-term rental. I feel like that's a win. Like mm -hmm. that is a total win. And then the sort of hack that we've added on top of that is doing the short-term rental to accelerate income and pay off on the properties. Because a lot of times what you'll hear is like properties are so expensive. You can't find anything that cash flows to which I would say, you know, it's, it is a huge mindset shift if you're looking at the appreciation and, um, you know, not sometimes people get so hung up on the cash flow part of it, or you'll hear the words cap rate, like what's the rate of return on the money that I'm investing in this property. And everybody has different goals, but what I see more often than not is people get hung up on those things and take themselves out of the game. So they're not making the move and investing, and then they're missing out on all of this appreciation, which by the way, like that rinse and repeat will also be, you know, helping us fund our retirement. It also leaves generational wealth because we can hold on to those properties and take we can continue to take equity out in the same way and have renters or short-term renters or whatever paying down that debt for us. And there's a whole bunch of benefits to that. So um, one of the huge benefits is say, okay, we've got $2.5 million in real estate right now. And if it doubles, like we're anticipating it to, in 10 years, we'll have $2.5 million worth of equity that theoretically we can access and you don't pay taxes on that equity that you're, so I can get a $2.5 million paycheck and not pay a dime of taxes on it. Um, wow. So, yeah, so I think people get short-sighted with some of the, um, real estate gurus, the way that they're approaching. And it keeps so many people out of the game that really could be in it if they mm -hmm. just tweaked the the way that they're thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the mindset element. And I definitely, I want to dive into that. But before we do, so let's just, let's go over the strategy again from like, kind of like, you know, a summary of it. So it's, it's the sort of rinse and repeat of, of what exactly and, and kind of how did it manifest for you? Was it linear? Or and so five years ago, we're what? And we're in 2024 now. So that's five years ago. So 2019. So let's go back to that point. Wh where were you guys as a family? And like, what were you thinking um, in terms of growing it? Well, at that point, so that it was the mindset was for me is I had 
mostly stayed home with my kids um, as they were growing up. So at that point, I, let's see, what did I have? I had basically like a 16 year old, a 14 year old and a 12 year old. Um, and because I had stayed home, I felt like we had a little bit of catching up to do as far as, or, you know, wages and saving for retirement. And that was part of the reason that I got into real estate. But then under, like when I learned how to do this, I was like, this is the, this is the key for us to make up for lost time. Um, so really in a nutshell, you know, the strategy is if you can qualify for one mortgage, there's, you can use rental income to help you offset another mortgage and another mortgage and another mortgage. So get into a house, let it appreciate, pull equity out, buy another primary residence. Um, you have renters go into the, the home that you're vacating. Um, and I, I say renters, but that could be depending on your market and your rules. It could be long-term, midterm. Um, it could be a lot of different ways, but um have renters paying for that mortgage you get into a new primary residence which you can get into a primary residence more like less expensively than you can uh an investment property um both in terms and you know how much you have to put down so basically that's 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 it <laughs> it's like get into one let it yeah. appreciate, pull equity out, have renters yeah. pay that down and keep doing that. For us, we want to have at least a property. We have three kids and we want at least three rental properties so that, you know, heaven forbid, like our kids yeah. would be able to, um, you know, have each have a home to live yes. in um, yeah. as well as, as us. Um, yeah. But We'll also, like I said, use those for funding retirement and we're teaching our kids this strategy too. So they, one, they know a lot about the like short-term rental business and kind of what our plan is. So they are very aware that our hope is that they would hold on to these properties because literally they could pay for their retirements you know if they manage them well and they can keep accumulating properties with the equity so that's our hope that's that's what we're hoping yeah um can i ask so okay so um when you're doing the sort of rinse and repeat or even with the first um house your residential property you let it a, a, um not accrue okay. what's the appreciate and then you said you take money out but are you taking essentially like the amount that has actually appreciated only like that little surplus or are you taking the whole amount and the other question i had was then you then you go and you buy the second property but then are you again only putting money for a deposit or are you actually putting money like or down payment um like a, a chunky down payment to lower your interest rate, like your payment, your re, your mortgage payments, or are you trying to pay it off entirely? Like, I guess I'm just trying to understand those little nuts and bolts of like how it works operationally. Right. I mean, so like any market, uh, whether it's real estate or the stock market, it's, it's this organic sort of living, breathing thing. Um, so in really, really general terms and maybe this will help is we what we've done is to answer the first part of the question um on the the i guess it was our second home but the one that we were like oh this is how you take the equity out keep in mind we'd been in that home for 10 years more than 10 years by the time we took equity out of it also keep in mind that a huge chunk of that was in the massive recession that we had so we didn't have like the gigantic you know appreciation that we would have hoped but yeah still uh, enough um so 
our strategy is to take out, you can usually take out up to, depending on the lender and a lot of other factors, but we'll just say for argument's sake, you can oftentimes take out up to 90% loan to value. So what that means is if you have, I'm just going to use a million dollars because mm -hmm. it's an easy number to work with. Yeah. Um, if you have a million a home that's worth a million dollars and by worth, that means it appraises at that. And um, you can take out 90% of that. Um, that means that you could take out theoretically 900,000, but you have to subtract off what you still owe on the home. So it's not, it's not as easy as like, okay, this is what we bought it for. This is what it's worth now. And we can only take that amount out. There's a couple different factors for that. And then what we've done is by buying a primary residence to live in, you can do that for as low as 5% down. So you don't have to have as much money to get into the home. And again, keeping in mind, like the overall strategy for me, I'm like, we're planting seeds for the future. And so again, you'll hear people talk about, you know, oh, the interest rates, oh, the, you know, low down payment, you'll have mortgage insurance. Um, mm. I don't really care <laughs> about all of that stuff because as long as that number of, okay, my if I have to have it as a long-term rental, will it work? Okay. Yes, it does. Great. And we've, we have currently homes, um, you know, that we've purchased. We have one that has a 2.6 interest rate. We have one that has a 7.7 .7 interest. Like, mm -hmm. so I think the message that I want people to really get is you're doing yourself a disservice if you're waiting for the perfect property, for the perfect interest rate, for the perfect market, because it's really time in the market that matters. So, you know, create a plan and get in the game and you'll, you'll see the benefits um, over time. That is great advice. I love that. So let's, okay, so let's now talk about the mindset and this idea of, and I'm sure these are some of the challenges also that, you know, people face and maybe you have faced and are your clients. Um, mindset, this idea that, you know, imposter syndrome creeps in and a lot of people say like, who am I to start getting involved in real estate because they never had that modeling for themselves. Like they didn't have family who were involved in real estate you know, how, how does one adapt the right mindset? And, you know, yeah, I'd love to hear what you think. That's, that's a big one. <laughs> um, well, one, I think specifically for real estate investing, I think there's a lot of noise out in the world, um, with different experts. And I'm not saying that one way is right and one way is wrong. There's a lot of different ways that you can invest. Um, I do think that there's a lot of talking heads out there that I you know, mentioned earlier that are like, you have to have this number right and this number right. And I think the, the unfortunate part of that is that it keeps so many people from doing it when there really is a way for them to do it and benefit greatly from it. So I think it's, you know, partially educating yourself on, you know, that there is, there are ways to do it that aren't necessarily the ways that some of the bigger talking heads are talking about doing real estate investing. And then I also think, you know, we all have stories about money from our childhood, from our personal experience. And I think that getting really real about what those stories may be, and for a lot of people, they don't even know that they're carrying some baggage there. Um, I, I have been one of those people, to be really honest, not really understanding. I'm still actually kind of working through some of that. Like, you know, yeah. um, like I mentioned earlier, my parents were entrepreneurs. They were really good at their craft, but not great with money. 
Um, so I think maybe digging into that part of it a little bit. And then just, this sounds so cliche, but I really feel like, let me be an example for you. Like literally, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And just understanding that if you can qualify for one mortgage, you can qualify for more than one mortgage and, and getting really clear about that. Yeah, absolutely. It seems also just to offshoot, like some general advice is this, cause I know you've mentioned this a couple of times is the idea of get, just getting that first qualifying mortgage. And so from a practical perspective, how does one, is it just going to their bank and they can just apply or is it should be talking to a mortgage broker or a financial advisor who is the person they should be seeking to get that i think that really i know your audience is in several different countries so i think it depends on where you are um for sure you know there's it's one of those people most likely a bank or a mortgage broker um and if 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 any of your listeners want help figuring that out in their market, I can help them find the right person. Um, it's just really kind of knowing the questions to ask. But specifically to the United States, um, mm -hmm. I would say you know working with a local realtor and a local lender mm -hmm. is key um, to getting that first mortgage. And there's a lot of first time home buyer programs for people who are maybe just getting started. Um, so it, it's so much of it is just who you know, and, you know, understanding what programs are available. Yeah. Um, to get into that first house. Yeah, 100%. And um, another follow up question I had regarding regard your strategy specifically, which is, did you guys just um, continue to build looking at the sort of rental slash serviced accommodation or have you guys kind of branched out to other areas of real estate like say commercial and or you know um public housing and different different there's so many branches of real estate so have you guys just focused I, primarily on building that portfolio of residential and or rent rentals short and long term so uh, right now we're all of our homes are considered single family homes. So even the one that has the guest house on the, you know, backside of the lot is a single family home. Um, the uses of them are different. Um, so we have short term rental. We're about to probably by the end of June, we'll have a midterm, which is like a 30 day plus um, up and running. And that that has more to do with local rules and regulations um, and that a bit of the like how much money we can make. Um, and then the other part that that we're diving into that I mentioned to you before is we're starting a nonprofit that will house people that are in transition. Um, but that's still in a single family house. It's just a, a different model where it's it's shared housing. And so um, I can, I can dive into that more, but that's, um, that's kind of where we're heading is all single family right now, but different, different types of income. Yeah. And I, well, I'd love for you to share it. Cause we were talking about that, that element of giving back, which you talked about, which is this idea of, um, offering housing solution to like homelessness or people in transition. Do you want to talk about what you're doing with that? Cause I mean, that's such a beautiful mission that you have. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're basically the, the model we're modeling um, our nonprofit after a uh, um, very successful nonprofit up in the Seattle area that has a similar um, type of homelessness problem. Um, and they've been very successful. It's called Kate's House. Um, and it's basically a shared housing, which means that there's multiple there's like usually two people per bedroom and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, but the idea is, is really beautiful in my opinion. Um, it's the idea of people who are in transition. So either coming out of incarceration, um, 
struggling with addiction and trying to get back on their feet, um, veterans, senior citizens, uh, foster kids is kind of where we're hoping to start. So a lot of times um, when foster kids age out of the system, they're like, they turn 18 and it's like, go ahead and go try to find a place to live um, as well as like a job and take care of yourself and stuff like that. Um, so the model is to create community within the home and also within the community and really try to have obviously like 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 experienced people in the same home so that they can have that community and then have support from other organizations outside of the home mm -hmm. um, but really give them the opportunity to get on their feet and get stable mm -hmm. and then hopefully you know they can move on to housing of their own I would like my ultimate goal is like to have somebody come into one of one of our homes and then be able to help them buy their own home I think that would be so awesome yeah oh I love that and, and will it be okay so you're starting with that now and is there is there like a because I, I love that it's nonprofit, but is there a commercial element to it as well like do you get some sort of funding to offset the costs or are you guys just purely using your own sort of profits to do that? Um, so that is a great question. Um, the residents will pay rent. So mm -hmm. there's different organizations that will help the residents pay rent. Yeah. Um, but it will basically funnel through the residents to the nonprofit. Yes. Um, and then the other part of, of that whole thing that I'm super excited about is that it also offers an opportunity for people who want to be investors can invest and buy the house that then the nonprofit will rent from them. Wow. For this program. Wow. Okay. And so this is falling separate from your own portfolio. This is like a separate sort of entity or does it fall under the same portfolio? So the, so the nonprofit is a separate entity. Gotcha. We're starting with our own investment properties yeah. um you know might make sure we're up and running and doing doing well um and have the yeah, kids yeah. worked out of it yeah um but yeah eventually then what would happen is people can buy the houses and the nonprofit would rent yeah the house from the person and there's a whole bunch of benefits for the investor for that um yes so and that that would be basically their their own LLC. That wouldn't obviously not be part of our portfolio. Portfolio. It's a really interesting. I just like how you're using like your knowledge in the real estate market to serve a community um, that is obviously disenfranchised and really helping them to, you know, as it was almost like a springboard in a way, which is really. Um, a beautiful way of sharing the knowledge that you've gained and also like the structuring. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing that. So, okay. Yeah. So let's just um, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you have faced kind of entering this world of real estate financing, real estate investing. Um, what are some of the challenges and how did you actually overcome some of these challenges? Oh, I, I think, you know, that what I shared in the very beginning about just not knowing how to make this happen was probably the biggest challenge. And once mm -hmm. I understood how to make that happen, um, I, I feel like that has been, you know, that was like the biggest one to unlock. Mm -hmm. Um, I can talk about a whole bunch of challenges, uh, <laughs> you know, probably not, not what people would expect. I think we hear again, like, don't believe everything you hear in the news. Like people think Airbnb, you're going to have partiers and they're going to wreck everything. And they're, hor you know, that has not been our experience. And that's not been the experience of many other Airbnb owners that I know now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally think that like Airbnb is actually a great way to go because you have eyes on the property frequently, unlike a long-term rental, and I'm not against long-term rentals at all. Um, but there are some benefits that aren't really talked about in the media. Um, 
but we, you know, like the last house that we bought, we had a really challenging time with the lender. Just, it was somebody that I hadn't used before. And, you know, there, there's just typical real estate challenges. Probably the biggest challenge for uh, Airbnb is manage, the managing it isn't really that hard. It's the having good cleaners that show up consistently. Um, that's probably the biggest challenge there. Yeah. Um, but that's pretty easy to, to overcome. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, as far as the lender part of it, I, um, you know, I, I wanted to use a different loan product. And so I went to a different lender and I've done this. This is sort of a thing I've done throughout various careers. Like I try stuff on myself first and then see how it goes. And, um, before I, you know, offer that out to other people, that's the same thing we're doing with a nonprofit. It's like, let me be the guinea pig on this. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So those three obstacles, the education and the kind of lender, new lender, and then also, um, what was the third one you mentioned? You the said clean, just cleaners. cleaners that's Airbnb. right. Yeah. So like operational, what, like in terms of those three, how, how did you overcome it? Like, so the education, so did you just start taking courses? Did you start, um, you know, cause I, I remember hearing in one of your first, um, podcast episodes, you talked about, you interviewed actually Vince Kingston and mm -hmm. it felt like he was a pretty big instrument in terms of, you know, your education in this area. Is that like, were you doing that? Were you kind of, it sounds like you were almost taking things into your own hands and getting educated. Is that how you overcame that, that part? I, yeah, I think, you know, when you, like we have, it's like when you're interested in something and curious about something, then when that opportunity comes up, you'll like, you're more receptive to hearing it and seeing it. And I yeah. think because of that experience, you know, many, many years ago of not having the right person to help. Um, so what happened, I wasn't actually actively seeking how do I do this? But there was a continuing education class. Realtors have to continually take education classes. And Vince had a, a class called Get Rich Slow. And it was about real estate investing. And I was like, oh, that's that sounds interesting. And then when I went, I was like, oh my gosh, my mind was so blown. He makes it so easy to understand. And I literally went up to him after the class and was like, I want to teach everybody I can how to do this. Will you help me? And he's yeah. like, yeah, sure. So we started doing um, classes together. But yeah, he was a huge, I'm so grateful to him. He, by mm. the way, was not the lender that I had the problem with. No, 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 no. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, cool. Um, and so, yeah, go, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. And then on the other ones, you know, um, the cleaners, it's just... I don't know. It's like, how do you like, I guess I'm a, a very persistent person, so I don't give up easily. And, you know, I, so much of my job is figuring stuff out. So mm -hmm. it's like, I just figure it out. And the like the cleaners, that's been something that we've, we've had a several different routes of taking care of that. So, I mean, I've had my kids <laughs> clean Airbnbs. Um, so I, I guess just having the gumption to, to know that I can figure things out is probably the biggest overarching, you know, like when your back's against the wall, you figure it out, right? Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Um, some of the challenges I thought that might come up or at least are maybe fears that people have talked about to me and also I would think of myself is um having a void of tenants if you're doing sort of long term or even short term but just having that sort of void um so how would you okay so let's I'll, I'll then I'll, I'll there's just one or two other ones that I was thinking about but how, how would you what would you say if someone's like oh I'm really scared about the voids that could happen in property in rentals I, so yeah, that, that 
that's a possibility. Like, I don't ever want people to think that having a vacancy or, you know, like, but you factor that into your numbers when you're deciding on the property. So like on Airbnb, I figure at least a 75% occupancy rate, which means that it's 25% not occupied. Um, so that's goes back to some of the education piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a big proponent of property managers. I think, you know, if you figure that cost, which is usually for long-term rental, like eight to 10% of the rental income, mm -hmm. just figure that into your numbers when you're deciding if the property works for you or not. And then you are, it takes away a lot of stress and the people that I see sticking with it usually have a property management. The people that are like, ah, I want out are the ones that are trying to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and you can have the same for Airbnb, you know, there's property managers for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. That's good. And then the other thing that I was thinking of with like, cause I also like to have for me, whenever I'm, I always like to, I know I like to know what, what's the worst case scenario and and can, like, what's the exit strategy? Like, how do I press the brakes if I need to? So in real estate, the way I've tried to justify this idea of like, if we were to go into this, you know, and ex and, and follow this sort of uh, expansion, um, I thought, oh, well, in a worst case scenario, like you can always just sell your properties if you have to and pay back the loans to the bank. And hopefully because of the, um, uh, Oh my appreciation. Gosh, appreciation. Why can I think of that? It's A. It's like I I keep wanting to say like a crew. The accumul yeah, the um <laughs> oh my gosh. The um, accumulation. The accumulation. Appreciation. appreciation. Accumulated wealth. Appreciated. <laughs> the appreciation. Hopefully you'll get something back. So you won't be like in the red. Is that do you think that that is a good sort of like, well, in a worst case scenario, at least you know you can always sell property and you may not get what you want or what you expect, but at least you can do that and then pay back the lenders if you really absolutely had to. I think that is a worst case scenario. I would also caution people to have that be the backup um, just because it kind of depends on, again, there's a, it's a moving organic thing. A real estate market is and so, you know, in the great real estate recession, you were hearing people, you know, you're hearing the term being underwater in your mortgage. And what that means is that you owe more on it than what you could sell it for. So what I would say is a better plan um, is to make sure that you have enough reserves that you could keep that property going through an event like that or through an event like COVID where, you know, people were not having to pay their rent and maybe there was, you know, a lag time between when the government stepped in and started giving rental assistance and all of that stuff. So I, I would say um, to factor into your finances, a six, minimum six, but better a 12 month like I have in my reserves 12 months that I can pay for this property without a renter. And okay. I think that's a better yes. safety net. Yeah. Um, and then yes, like if, and then you could do what you said, you know, you're like, okay, maybe I can't sell it right now. Mm -hmm. um, if there's some kind of an event that makes it so the property is not worth as much as what you paid for it, but make sure that you can hold on to it until that's smart until you could sell it. Um, yeah. And do you use um, like a specific formula every time you get rent and or income, like whatever you get, do you say like the profits, you, presumably some for taxes, but then like, do you also apportion a certain amount of those profits and say like 10, 20% is going to the reserve fund? Or do you, is there some sort of formula or do you just like guesstimate? Um, so we, we have the reserves up front. So like we're not starting out with a oh, property that doesn't have those 
reserves. So if we use like if we dipped into those reserves for some reason, then yeah, we would pay that back. Um, so for us, we I mean, we do have um, you know, set aside like one to two percent, which seems like a lot, one to two percent of the purchase price of the property is what we're holding on to every year out of the proceeds of rental income and that's more for like repairs um so you know on a five hundred thousand dollar house one percent is five thousand dollars which kind of seems like a lot but then you think okay but if we need a roof or a furnace or you know exterior paint like you're holding on to that so that when you need it you have it versus yeah. you know um and then, you know, it, it it's a little bit different for short-term rental versus long-term rental, like what we're setting aside um, or what we're factoring in for our expenses, because in long-term rental, we wouldn't be paying utilities, but with short-term rental, we are, right. um, that kind of stuff. So then you said it was 1%, 1% to 2% of the total value of the property or of the profits that are coming in total value total value wow okay so if let's say your total value for that year i don't know 20,000 let's just say on a 500,000 you're taking 5,000 that's the 1 to 2% it's like a contingency plan for repairs and then do you take an additional amount for that sort of reserve to pay off the mortgage or you can um we're not again we're not we're not super focused on early payoff of mm -hmm. the mortgage. That's just not our strategy. Mm -hmm. You could if you wanted to, and that would accelerate, um, you know, potentially how much you could take out again if you're doing that rinse and repeat. So if you're paying down your your principal, you're paying less in interest over the life of the mm -hmm. loan. Um, you're also freeing up money if you did want to get a, a HELOC on that property. So um, to me, I feel like it's just more valuable to have the money in your bank account in the event of an emergency than it is to pay off. Yeah. And again, going back to like making sure up front that our worst case scenario of a long-term renter works yeah. with our numbers. Mm. Um then we're not super worried about it because I don't think I really emphasize this, but in our area, rents have consistently also gone up. So if it works on day one as a long-term rental, chances are it's, you know, two years in, it's going to just be better as a, yeah. a rental. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, okay. So if we have listeners who are interested in learning more about real estate investing, particularly I'm talking about beginners, right? What, would you recommend in terms of resources and education what would you what would you kind of say this is a good place obviously your podcast is a good place <laughs> but is there any other resources that you think would be helpful um so yeah i love yes i will totally shamelessly plug my podcast um, sure yeah it it is on that episode one you'll get the full uh rundown of what I learned. Um, and if you have questions, you know, people can certainly reach out to me or Vince. Um, I, some other resources um, that I like bigger pockets is a website. Um, they have a podcast as well. And books. Um, one of the things that you can do um, is sign up for like a, an annual membership, and then you get access to a lot of tools. So when you're looking at properties, you can go in and plug in the address and number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and it'll tell you what the expected short-term rental income, long-term rental income, you know, so you can get a pretty good snapshot of those numbers, which is really important when you're starting to look. Um, so I think that's a great resource. Which website, which website was that? It's Bigger Pockets. Oh, it's that same one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, I mean, 
as far as like there's so many books and stuff i honestly haven't read a ton of books one of my favorites though just in the mindset part of it is rich dad poor dad mm, um yeah yeah i think that is a good just like thinking differently than maybe the way that we have been taught to think about money and investing and you yeah. know creating yeah, yeah, wealth yeah, yeah. great yeah. well look Anne, this has been super helpful um I have one more question before we go on to the Envisionaire questionnaire. What, and it's just my own like curiosity. What do you think about investing in different jurisdictions? So let's say you're like, I'm in England and I'm like, I love California or I love Oregon and I want to invest there. What do you think of that in terms of building your portfolio? I think it is a hundred percent doable if you are connected to a realtor that really understands your goals. So only 37% of realtors actually are real estate investors, which I find that number to be really low considering the, you know, knowledge and opportunity, you know, that, that is available. To, I mean, it's available to anybody, but you would think realtors would be more excited about it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think if you have the right people in place, it's totally doable. I think that you need to be really clear about what your goals are. Um, so for example, if somebody wanted to use my strategy, it probably isn't going to work that well, like in the Midwest, because they don't have the same type of appreciation that we have on the West Coast. So um you know, so then you might need another strategy. It also depends, like, are you trying to make money, you know, quickly to build up funds to build a portfolio, then you might be more interested in fix and flip. And that might make more sense to get started in a, a less expensive market. So it, it really depends on your goals. But yeah, I think in general, if you have the right people, it's totally totally doable um and again i'm happy to be that resource i think i mentioned to you i'm helping a buyer right now you know get a vacation home slash vacation rental in turks and caicos which is super super yeah, fun that's amazing um, and she lives in montana so <laughs> like well this. i hope you're going to be getting um the you know the keys every once in a while to go and stay in turks and caicos sounds great yeah. um and on that, on the, this idea of like, obviously knowing the geographical locations that people should invest in, um, one follow-up question is, are there certain like cities that you think are just saturated and, or like you would not advise it's, it's almost not too late. Well, maybe it is, I don't know, but like, do you think it's ever too late to invest in certain, like we're talking about the super high end, like we're talking about LA, Manhattan, London, like do you, do you think that there's a, I'm sure there's pros and cons to both, but I'm just wondering in your perspective that, what you think of that? I tend to be a glass half full person. So I feel like there's always opportunity everywhere. It's mm -hmm. just really understanding that market and what your goals are and how those things, you know, come together. But yeah, I mean, for sure, well, I, I mean, I could go into a whole thing about the West Coast, but um, I, there are rules and regulations. I'll just use my city in particular, um, where I've got so many thoughts racing through my head right now. So one, here's a couple of things to keep in mind. So in the city that I'm in, in Portland, Oregon, we we have a lot of rules and regulations that are promoting density versus sprawl with our building codes. So that means, I mean, that we we are limited in how much we can additional housing we can build. Um, so even though we're in, and this, that's very similar in other major West Coast cities. Um, so I think that people think 
that there's a saturation in places like you know LA San Francisco like how can people even afford a home there and while we may be getting closer to that you have to think too that people have been saying that for decades like it's always easy to look in the rearview mirror and be like oh I, it, if only I could have bought a home you know in Portland Oregon when the average price was $150,000 and now it's over $500,000 you know so there's that but a couple of key things to think of in our specifically in the United States um we have millennials are hitting peak home buying age baby boomers are not vacating their homes as quickly as they're living longer they're healthier so they're not freeing up inventory to saturate those millennials, which by the way, there's more millennials than there are baby boomers. So right there, you have this tension of supply and demand. From the previous housing crash, we, um, we're still about 12 years behind in catching up building homes to, to have enough inventory to satisfy demand. So. I mean, when you think of all of those things, at least here in the United States, I think that there's every good reason to buy in just about every market. Um, I won't claim to be an expert in every market, but I think there is opportunity. Um, but I, I just don't see us going down in prices, which if you're the owner, you want you want to be experiencing yeah. that appreciation so yeah. I don't I guess the other part of that answer is I don't know there probably is some place but I just don't see see a place where you couldn't find an opportunity yeah well I love the glass half full so I'm with you on that and um I will be contacting you when we're ready to buy in yeah. the west coast uh yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, thanks so much. And let's let's move on to the final uh, part of the podcast. I, again, feel like you're just such a wealth of knowledge and I'm really enjoying just learning so much about you, about from about you, but also about the real estate um, financing and investment um, strategy. So thank you for sharing all of that information. Of right. So there you go. The Envisionaire Questionnaire. This is a fun feature of the podcast where we ask guests to look, reflect on their past, uh, consider their present and look to the future. And so looking back on your past, what advice would you give your 15 year old self, 15 year old Anne? <laughs> um, what advice I would honestly, my 15 year old self, I would say, um, if I knew then what I know now, I would seriously tell my parents, like, please put whatever money you were going to put towards my college education towards a house for me honestly wow. yeah. <laughs> because and I can share this with you I actually did the math on this and I was like had they done that and they they did what they could um yeah. but I still ended up with a whole bunch of student loan debt and I did go back and look at like the average home prices and had they purchased a home with a very low down payment when I started college, I could have had the home and pulled the equity out and paid off the student loans very quickly. Yes. And I could still own the home if I knew yes. then what I know now. So that yeah. would be one of the things I would tell them. My 15 That's year really old good self. advice. I, we had a guest on who um, is a, a real estate kind of expert within the UK and um, anyway, property wealth, he builds, it's, 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 it's excellent. He was on the podcast, Paul Smith, and he actually shared what he had done with his daughter was he had gotten her for when she went to university, they'd taken out a mortgage. It's called, I think it's called a springboard mortgage. And it's like a hundred percent, 100 percent finance. I don't know. Anyway, I don't really, sometimes it's words, I don't really get the jargon right. But anyway, essentially, um, he gave her that so that then she could rent out the house to two of her friends. So they were paying the mortgage back. And by the three or four years, I mean, she basically had a house in her name. 
I mean, that is just blew my mind. Like, yep. what is, and it seems so obvious. You hear it and you're like, how did I not think about that? Because it's not even part at the forefront, you know, but it's just, it's a lack of, of education and a lack of knowledge. That's really what it is. Well, and yeah, and the stories, it's so hard to change the story that we've been taught, which is the way to build wealth is to go to college and then get a good job and, you know, do all of these things. And that may have been true, you know, 50 years ago. But I mean, there's some also very alarming statistics in the United States anyway, about where we are with people retiring as far as like people are very poor here when they retire in general only like one percent of people are considered wealthy and over 50 percent are dependent on family and others to survive in retirement here which is really frightening to me yeah yeah um so it's a lot of just like changing the the mindset yeah 100 percent. okay looking back uh look reflecting on your present um who would you like to have dinner with tonight if you could have dinner with anyone in the world oh gosh okay um just one person uh, <laughs> yeah let's just say one person <laughs> okay <laughs> um that's a tough one I was, I'm going to, I would say Barack Obama or Oprah Winfrey. Those are, I love it. Those are my choices too. I love it. But Oprah, number one, and then Obama. (laughs) It's hard to beat Oprah. Um, I know, I know. She's just. If I'm being honest, I would, yeah, I would probably pick her over. (laughs) Yeah. But but Obama's like just, oh, I mean, he's just amazing, right? Like just think of the charisma he brings to the, you know, the table, literally. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, I think, I think what I like with both of them is just their, their, they have a different approach to thinking. They're yeah. Thought leaders, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Love that. Um, okay. So looking towards your future, what's one goal that you would like to achieve in the next five years? In the next five years, this is just present, presently forefront of my mind. Um, So my husband works for Nike. And if you've been paying attention in the news, they consistently have layoffs, like, and they're very stressful. Um, They just had one and he thankfully made it through. But I think in five years, and I have no doubt that this will happen, but just having him be completely retired and not dependent on that. I'm grateful for everything that Nike has given to us through his employment. Um, But having him, having it be not stressful. Yeah. Which actually it wasn't, it was stressful this time around, but it was like, we'll be okay either way. Um, But just, I would love to have him not be working. I love that. That's a beautiful gift. And I hope that you guys get that. Um, it seems like you're on the right track. And so, but yeah, of course, those sorts of, I think there's always this element when you're like, when you're an employee, you know, you're always at the whim of someone else and it's not personal and it never, it's really just about the business metrics. Right. So, but, but what you guys are doing now, you're building like this autonomy, which I think is great. So I'm excited for you guys. Thank you. Well, and yeah, one when you said that, I'm like, that's another thing. Like we have we have all these little mindset shifts. Like we think that working for somebody is safe. And it's like, but is it really? I don't I don't know. I it mean, depends on the employer, you know? And even then, yeah. it's sometimes it's not personal. It's just what they have to do, you know? Yeah. 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 So Oh, and thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I, I think this has been so brilliant and thank you for letting me pick your brain and, and, you know, and, and I really appreciate you answering so openly and honestly, um, in such a helpful manner. 
if people want to connect with you, obviously we have your podcast that they can reach out to, and I'll put that all in the show notes. Um, but is there anything else, any, any way else that they can connect with directly with you? Probably the easiest way, um, is through Instagram. I'm at Ann Reed and co. Um, that's probably the easiest. Um, but yeah. And a few or good doors, a few good doors. That's the podcast to listen to. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you again. We're sending you so much love and I hope there's a lot of sunshine in Oregon today. Is there a lot of sunshine? It is. Yes. It's finally sunny. sunny. It's a little cooler today than it has been. We're in the upper sixties, but yeah. I don't know what that is. I don't know what upper sixties is. Do you know what it is in in like Celsius? (laughs) <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know either. But anyway, but it's sunny, so that's good. Whereas in the UK today, it was a bit, it was is overcast. Um, but yes. Anyway, well, we're sending you so much love, and thank you again for being on the podcast. Just brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it, and um, look forward to having you on mine. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you hit subscribe and check out this video here.